it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show today. Everyone's very excited. I oh. know, you know, you've seen, I, I know what you've done from over the years, but even just recently with Jedi Survivor and Turgle, I mean, <laughs> you saw what happened when you put it on Twitter, blew up. Anyway, yeah. How's your, how's your year been so far, mate? Thanks for coming on. Well, thank you for having me, Dan. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, my year has been like surprisingly good. Um, as I, as we were talking about earlier, it seems to be like a, a reunion year for me. Um, because first the power Rangers, uh, uh, once and once and always, uh, movie on Netflix came out. Um, and that was the 30th anniversary. So that was 30 years ago. Oh, yeah. And then Turgle was, you know, uh, a couple of days uh, mocap and then one day of um, of voiceover. And I thought, well, it's a cute little character. I didn't think much about it. And then suddenly I see all these memes coming out. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm Turgle, right? So, um, <laughs> so I can't complain. It's been a good year. Thank you for asking. What's it like going from hand model to one of the best voice actors and actors in the world? <laughs> What's that transition like, man? You've either read, uh, you've either <laughs> read my website or Wikipedia, right? Is that where you got that from? I think it came from your mouth. Oh, I don't know. Maybe it probably uh, is. Did it wrong? Come, it, it's true. I oh, it is true. Hand okay. model now. In all fairness, I was 10 when I was hand modeling, <laughs> and now I'm like 20. So it was a <laughs> man, you um, have it, you have an, you've aged very well. I haven't aged, I haven't aged a year. <laughs> um, I oh, guess man. hand modeling was fun, I can't complain, but I long to be respected for more than just my beautiful hands. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not going back into that industry, not dabbling back in. No, all. I think no. I, my modeling days are are, are long oh. behind me. Oh, well. Uh, so when do you actually remember from your career when you knew this was it, this is what I want to do, and and you were able to do it, you know, from a monetary standpoint? Like when was the money coming in enough and when were you getting enough jobs where you could actually do this and you're like, wow, I'm living my dream? Yeah, I, I'm, uh, I'm very fortunate, you know, because it's, you know, when I you look at, the percentage of working actors and you realize i realize i'm i'm coming up on 50 years as a as a professional actor and again i'm only 20 so it's weird i don't know how that works but um i knew at five years old the first time i was sat in front of a tv set that that's what i wanted to do i was a huge fan of don adams and get smart and um i loved variety shows particularly the flip wilson show and tom jones and the Ed Sullivan show and all these shows. And I knew um, that I wanted to exist in those worlds. Um, I, I I mean, I, I was raised uh, in my generation. I was raised on shows like the Brady Bunch and the Partridge family and Gilligan's Island and get smart and all of them. Brilliant shows. And, yeah. uh, brilliant shows. Um, I kind of miss the, the sitcom <clears throat> formula because there's not a lot of sitcoms anymore. There really isn't. There's a lot of, um, kind of streaming shows that they, you can kind of binge watch. But um, but the great thing about it was that uh, <clears throat> I, um, I as I grew up and, and started working um, at more and more studios, I ended up working with a, a majority of the people I grew up watching on TV. Um, wow. Like I, I worked with Alan Hale, the skipper from Gilligan's Island. In fact, I got to play Gilligan to his skipper, which was an amazing thing. Um, but to answer your question, um, I started working at about 10 and kind of uh, making good money by the age of 13, had a good deal of money, um, supported, you know, a lot of the things that I needed growing up, you know, and helped my family out and stuff. Uh, but when I went to uh, UCLA, I was there for a quarter and uh, I was cast in a sitcom in the 1980s. And that sitcom was called Safe at Home. And I thought it was just going to be a, you know, maybe a season if I was lucky. And it ended up being three three uh, seasons, but we did 103 episodes in those three seasons. And from there, I went on to film, film work and then into voiceover eventually. So I never got back to UCLA. And so I've been very fortunate that probably since the age of about 18 years old, I've been supporting myself as an actor. 
How, how surreal is it when you're working with some of these people that you've looked up to or seen on the TV and then you're with them in a project? I mean, how do you keep your wits about you and your nerves? Because you're only young at this point as well. Um, <clears throat> I'm a fanboy. I'm still a fanboy. <laughs> There's no yeah. doubt about it. Um, I was at a convention a couple of years back and I was sitting with Lee Majors, the $6 million uh, man. But I had grown up watching him as uh, Heath Barkley in the Big Valley. But um, I um, I became fast friends with him. And I thought to myself, wow, there's still a part of me because, wow, I'm sitting here with, you know, the $6 million man. I'm here with Steve Austin. Um, and so uh, I, I was always just so such a big fan. I, I, there was never a part of me that was ever that ever lost the magic of being on a set or being at a studio where like, you know, I, I worked at MGM, which is now Sony Pictures, but back then it was MGM. And so I could walk to the stage where they, you know, they shot so many famous movies and and I'm still giddy every time I get to go on on lot still. And so you're still loving it, even with, you know, going in to do Star Wars motion capture, like how much fun was that? Because I don't know how much mocap you have done or performance caps you've done over your career, but. Yeah. It's a good question. Um, I had, the very first mocap thing I had done was a thing called um, the Darkling, and that was from a a, a very <laughs> naughty video game, like foul language left and right. But not that I'm adverse to foul language. But how long ago was this? The Darkling. I'm just the Darkling. To it. Um, yeah. I'm trying to remember. It was. It had to have been at least twenty years ago at this point. It oh, was okay. early mocap. Early. Mo-cap. Oh wow. Okay. And back then. I, you know, it was all the ping pong balls on your face and on your body and everything. It took an hour just to get into this, these ping, these you know, little <laughs> ping pong balls. And I would just stand in front of a camera and it was like shooting a movie and it still is. You had to, you had to cut between lines. Whereas if you go into record a video game, you just do three in a, three in a row, three takes in a row. Uh... But doing um, this one was probably the biggest um, mocap I had done in my career. Um, and wow. I, was, I shot that for two days. That was just like shooting a movie, um, except you get to move more and you have to actually get to, it's, it's all staged and you're interacting with the other actors and everything. So it's just like shooting a movie. And so that part of it came easy for me. Now, was it, was the suit comfortable? Not always. <laughs> it, was it unflattering? Yeah. Put me on a diet after I saw myself, but What's amazing about it, if you look at Turgle, those little jumps and everything are things that I did at the at the direction of the amazing director, Tom Keegan, who directed us all in the um, in the uh, in the shoot. Um, and he would say, do it, do like a turtle esque thing. And so that's where I came up with the jump. So when you see me jump and run off and stuff and really you only see me very briefly in this game, which is why I'm amazed <laughs> that people yeah. think so. Cause, yeah, because he's is... apparently I'm a I'm gloop gloop shido. Is that how you say it? <laughs> I think you so. know, is that yeah. right? Yeah, I think so. Uh, it's it's crazy how uh, I mean when you when you posted that on Twitter that the response you know so many people coming out and the yeah. memes and that and someone from Respawn, a, a designer there, he actually said the team kind of knew this was going to be a kind of a breakout character. But did you yeah. know? No, there was someone that that I had coached for voiceover that had worked there and said that, you know, I can't mention anything because it was under all under NDA. So we couldn't say anything about it. But she worked there and she had told me that that whatever this thing is that I was working on was like the 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 love of all the devs of the game. And so I thought that was just, you know, her being sweet. But it turned out apparently there was a whole glamour shots of Turgle going on and everything. <laughs> Man, it must be cool to finally do you know have a bit more meat on the bone in terms of mocap performance capture mm. and yeah. and actually embody the character, you know, because I know you've yeah. done so many voice work over the years to get in there as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, must be a, just super fun, and you might might have ignited a bit of something in you, I think, that you might want to do a bit more of this or what? You know, I would love to do more of it. I, you know, I, I rarely say no to a good story and a good, and a good thing. And this is actually a very good story. I really like this yeah. video. Um, 
I think that I've been fortunate because I was thinking about, I think I've been, I've, I've covered like most of the mediums of, of the entertainment industry. I've been on, I've been in, I've been on albums. I've been in books. I've been on stage. I've been in film. I've been on radio. I've been, you know, and now I've been in mocap and, and voiceover certainly has been a, a godsend. So I, I am very fortunate for voiceover because uh, I didn't start out to be in voiceover. In fact, I knew nothing about voiceover. Growing up, my favorite show was um, Speed Racer. That was oh, it. Yeah. But I didn't Aren't know. You? I never thought to myself, who's the voice of Speed Racer? Like, I didn't know it was Peter Fernandez yeah. until I was an adult. Same. And I, I just looked at voiceover as the cartoon was the thing and the voice mm -hmm. that, you know. Um, so I was really kind of naive to voiceover. And um, I had started out on camera and doing fairly well until there was a, a Writers Guild strike back in 88 not unlike the writers go strike we're currently just in the middle of um yeah and it kind of was it was like devastating to the whole industry and it was devastating to my on camera career cuz um i had done a movie called summer school that had just come out in 87 but by 88 we were in the middle of this strike so it was really hard to capitalize on that movie um and so i needed work and someone suggested you know my agency had a voiceover department and i knew nothing about it so I went in blissfully blind to the whole thing. And it just was like a, an ugly duckling coming home. It was just, you know, finally I wasn't made fun of because of my voice, which often I was, that was always, I was always the bane of jokes in the scripts because of my voice. Um, and so, you know, I learned to talk like this for on camera stuff and, you know, Hey, how are you doing? You know, it's like, that's not me. Mm. And so um, the voiceover turned out to be like a place for an ugly duckling to come home. And that's why I'm really grateful for it. So, were you ever self-conscious growing up? Like, did you mm. find it as a burden? And when did you make the transition where it from a burden to a gift? I was really self-conscious growing up because I was very small. I was very small. I was a very late bloomer, very late bloomer. Um, I don't even think I hit puberty till probably I was my senior year of high school. And so um, it was always a, a, a you know, a, kind of a source of, of um, uh, angst and sadness for me. But at the same time, I developed my sense of humor because, you know, I, I don't know that it's the healthiest thing to tell a kid now, but back then my mom and dad used to say, you know, make fun of yourself before they can make fun of you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that worked because I really learned to be very sharp and very quick and very, it like was how I honed my improv skills which came in very handy in the booth because if you watch like Billy and Mandy or you watch Invader Zim or Angry Beavers, a lot um, of improv? I do ton of improv, mm. ton, ton of improv. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was kind of like a, a source of, of uh, sometimes embarrassment. Uh, but when did it become a positive? Probably when I started making money with this voice. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! So is this your first time playing a frog? Because I know you've played an alien, a demon, a a squirrel. Uh, you know, <laughs> you could kind of call gray matter in Ben Ten amphibious. Uh, yeah. He's an amphibian creature, alien. Yeah. So he's probably the closest thing. And he was kind of like this. Oh man, it's time to go, hero. Which is just you know, like Johnny Carson on helium is basically what <laughs> what I call it. But um. Yeah. So I guess that's the closest to an amphibian creature, amphibious creature that I've ever played. What did they tell you about him? That he's a bit of a schemer, a bit of a, mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. was the background law that you got for this one? Um, That he was a scam artist. He was a con man, but not very good at it. Um, but <laughs> um, I mean, it would have been very easily easy just to make him annoying. And, and I, and I'm always like, I played a lot of annoying characters. <laughs> the one that comes into mind is Ratchet and Clank, I think. The, the, the Rift oh, Apart. Oh, you're talking about, well, I, I've done a lot of characters on I Ratchet know. and Clank. Zircon, um, I think it is, Junior. Yeah, Zircon Junior. Yeah. Yeah, which, yeah, which was a fun one. And that was really big and over the top. But yeah, I love yeah. doing that, you know? But that was still fun. But It was know. fun. Yeah. It was fun. Um, I, well, the way I got into the, the, Ratchet and Clank, Clank franchise is an interesting story because um, I was a fan of the game. So 
uh, over the years, I don't know if if your um your audience knows, but I've played the Zoni, I played Stuart Zergo, I played Pollux, I yeah. played a lot of the characters. You've been in nearly every one. Almost every one. Yeah. Almost every one. And the way I, I got into it was I um my son, my oldest son, who's now 26. Uh, again, I'm only 20, so I was an early bloomer, yeah. almost, late bloomer, so we'll have to fix that. Um, <laughs> he um, he was probably about seven, maybe, or so, and he wanted a video game. And, you know, we were these parents like, well, we got to be very cautious about what video games we don't know. And it was back in the days when there were actually video game stores where you could go in and actually yeah. rent these games, right? So yeah. um, I walked in... Um, to the uh, counter and I asked the uh, the clerk, I have a seven-year-old son, wants to play video games. What's one that's not too violent, that's not too blah, blah, blah. And without hesitation, they go, oh, we got, we got the perfect games for you. And it was Ratchet and Clank and Jack and Daxter. And I loved both of them. I played them as much as the kids do. I absolutely fell in love with them. I, I love Jack and Daxter one, not a big fan of Jack and Daxter two, too hard to fly the the ship around. But, uh, yeah, it went too far with it, you reckon? Uh -huh, yeah. And I became I became a um I became a gamer at that point. So I was really into playing Ratchet and Clank and I played all of them and unlocked all the levels and I've played every single Ratchet and Clank. So after I'd become a fan of the first game, I was hired to do another video game for um Insomniac Games. And I'm not I'm not sure what that game was now at this point, but when I walked in, I didn't realize that Insomniac was the was the uh, the developer of Ratchet and Clank. And when I went in, there was this huge mosaic picture of Clank with all these little pictures of the from scenes of the game. And I said, um, "Oh my God, Ratchet and Clank's my favorite game!" And they go, "Really?" I go, "Yeah." And they go, well, "What's your favorite thing?" And I told them every single level that I loved. I told them the weapons I liked, the ones I didn't like. The bouncy gun was good, but it wasn't great and all sorts of things. <laughs> and they really realized that I was a huge fan. And from that point on, they put me in every game. That's and, awesome. And if you unlock some of the uh, the levels after you've beaten the game on, like, I think it's Ratchet and Clank 3. It may be either Up Your Arsenal or Going Commando, one of them. Um the, the that that story is told by the uh, voice director until it talks that's about awesome. It. Yeah, has the team there stayed the same over the years, or is it has it moved around? Oh. Or For insomnia, they're phenomenal, by the way. They're they're yeah. like top tier. Yeah, they're so good. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's people that come and go. Uh, one of the writers, one of the main writers, uh, TJ of of the game. Um, he sold a huge script to Hollywood. And so he became like a movie writer. And so he left, but he was very instrumental in bringing me back and writing for me. And, um, uh, and so the, the people come in and out and the developers come in and out and stuff, but the, the quality of the games have, have just gotten better and better and better. Did you end up playing Rift Apart? Are you still uh, playing games these days? I you, have any played, time? I, you know what? First of all, I don't have a PlayStation Five yet. <laughs> um, I'm on a yeah. waiting list still. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But uh, let's see. Do I haven't played it yet? What's um, the last game you played to completion or finished that you remember? Uh, oh, of any game? Mm, any game? Psychonauts Two. Yeah, great game. <laughs> yeah, of course. Who you know? You play yes. Razin for anyone that doesn't know the main character. Yeah, yeah. I'm a big fan of that game. I, I found oh. that game to be amazing. And, and um, Tim Schafer is like one of my dearest friends. And uh, I'm very fortunate. The people that I work for actually become very good friends of mine. We actually socialize. Tim is one of them. And um, were you friends with him before you got the gig or you grew the relationship? No, Tim was a fan of Invader Zim. Oh. And oh, so yeah, nice. um, they contacted me for the game. And when I talked to Tim about it, I said, do I have to yell? Yes, I had been doing a lot of yelling. And he goes, no, absolutely not. In fact, you're a little kid. I'm like, oh, I love it. So all of a sudden, Raz was born. Well, I guess I could just move yeah. this over here. Um, and so, um, yeah, and so this was on the first game 20 years ago now. And um, so yeah. during one of our lunch breaks, uh, Tim, who was in town because he lived up north, but we were recording in down in 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 South Cal in the South Southern California, we went to the uh, 
uh, Universal Studios uh, uh, City Walk, and we went to the Hot Topic store there, and we bought a bunch of Invader Zim stuff, and I signed it for Tim because he was such a fan. And uh, we've been friends ever since. And not only did I do that game with Tim, but uh, I mean, Tim is like really, really good to his his actors. Um, I was in Brutal Legend. I was in a bunch of his uh, click point and click games. Um, and then, of course, uh, Raz. So. So that was great. And uh, yeah, I just really enjoyed that game a lot. What's he like working with? Because he is a bit of a visionary, the the projects that he does, especially, you know, Psychonauts 2 is one of my favorite games of, I think it was 2021 it came out, right? Yeah. Uh, it came out, wasn't it last year? I think it came out 2022, didn't it? Or did it come out 2021? It might have been. I've lost track. I've lost yeah, track. one of those anyway. But yeah, it was, was one of thing. the best of that I don't know year. if you've heard about this in Australia, but here in the States, we have this <laughs> thing called COVID. It's yeah. called the pandemic. I don't know if they, hey, that happened in Australia. Know, he, do you know who was in lockdown for the most days? Who? Melbourne, Australia. Melbourne. Oh, my favorite world. city. Yeah. Love Melbourne. <laughs> One of my favorite cities in the world. I could go back. I could live in Melbourne. Uh, I was right. I actually got you on this one, Richard. 2021. August ah, good. 25th. Yeah. Good. You know better than me. That's good. That's good. <laughs> I'll hear from Tim. Um, uh, have you been to the States? I have, yes, I yes. have. And did you find it much different than being in Australia? Um, mm, a little bit, yeah, a little bit. I, well, I felt, I just felt like I was at home. Everything about it felt exactly really, like. Really, yeah. Yeah, I went to Manly Beach, and Manly Beach felt to me like Laguna Beach here in Southern California. And, I think Melbourne... Uh, Melbourne specifically is, and Sydney are a bit like America. I would say yeah. you're probably right. Yeah. Um, of course, we don't have Hungry Jacks. We have Burger King. Burger King. Yeah. <laughs> but what we don't have, and is like my favorite thing in the world, is Pie Face. Pie Face, really? Pie you face. love Pie Face. There I, you go. Uh, there's nothing better than when I've had a few drinks <laughs> and I want to go into a Pie Face and get the chicken and broccoli or the beef and potato. I mean, yeah. oh, I love Pie Face. And I, I think they tried to do Pie Face in New York here. Didn't work? But I, I don't think. It may still be there, but it never took off here. And I was thought to myself, wow, I should start a Pie Face franchise here in in, <laughs> in, in Los Angeles. Did you ever try any of the delicacies down here, like Vegemite? And, oh, um, I tried Vegemite once, yeah. and that was enough. <laughs> yeah. Uh, kangaroo. Yeah. Try oh, it. did you? Wow. Yeah. How'd you find that? A bit tough. Uh, uh, yeah. 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 I was. I'm. I'm. Uh, I'm a carnivore. Sorry to all my all my herbivores and vegetarians and vegans out there, but I love like jerky, and they have things. And if there's a kind of jerky, they make a kangaroo jerky. They make a bison jerky, etc. I ate a lot of bison as well. Um, if I find it too gamey, I don't like it at all. Mm. Uh, kangaroo, a little bit of that. So yeah. I, you know, and plus after you meet a hundred, I, I went to one of those, you know, <laughs> outdoor kangaroo wallaby farms where they were just everywhere. They're just strewn about everywhere. You had to step over them. Um, and I go, how can you eat these things? I know I'm, I'm, I'm the same. It's like a national animal. How can you, it is. you Can't know, eat I, just, I feel like I just, I'm just doing the wrong thing. So I stay away. Exactly. But, um, I, agree. I would never do that again. But, you know, everything once, maybe. <laughs> and what are other fans any different in Melbourne or in Perth or down here? Because you've been to so many cons over the years, and I'm sure you've got so many stories from so many different fans. But do the fans change in different areas or is there a commonality? Um, I think the, the thing that I noticed uh, – the most about the, the fans is that my career luckily spans three or four decades now. So a lot of the kids that grew up on my show are now bringing their kids yeah. to, to meet me. So that changes. Um, but like, depending upon the show, like um, I have a tendency to do shows that are attractive to kind of the outsiders like i always felt kind of the the people on the outskirts the cult favorite the cult fan things you know 
Like with Invader Zim, there were a lot of kids that really appreciated it because they they felt like that was the thing that that like took them out of their like a lot oftentimes depression in school and stuff like that because they felt heard and seen. So that kind of fan, um, a lot of them, I got a lot of uh of goth fans. Um uh so but overall, I would say the fans are all just so sweet and respectful and delightful, it, no matter where I've traveled through the world. And it's really just very, it's, it's like, it, it like touches me when I think about it, because I, I've, I've told this story before, but oftentimes I'll be at a um, convention and someone will come up and they'll be just crying because some of them were in the hospital and they would watch my show and it would be the only time they'd laugh. Um, yeah, I, I have a lot of fans in the um the autistic um community um and um a lot of times their parents will come up to me and say you know um my my kids wouldn't react to anything but then when they heard your voice they suddenly would smile and cheer up and pay attention and so um that touches me soldiers come up to me that say that they were in, in combat and that their family would send them like the dvd set of invader zim and after they'd be in a horrific uh you know battle fight the only thing that would make them smile again was when they could go back and put in this dvd and they would laugh again so wow. things like that uh are just so like heartwarming and touching to me and just like leave me speechless because you know when you're in a booth with some friends you know laughing and joking you don't know where your your shows are going to reach or your work is going to reach and when you realize the the, the large reach um of these shows it's it's like uh just amazing it's amazing i can't think of any other word but amazing do you remember i, I saw a clip of you singing with the ukulele making yeah. everyone laugh playing elvis doing a bit yeah. of elvis's zim do you remember that story uh yeah i believe that was at i think that was at one of the invader cons um because yeah, it was actually so. a full convention um uh that was just invader zim and we did wow. three of them, as a matter of fact. Uh, Ricky Simons, who plays Gurr on Invader Zim, he was the first one to start playing the ukulele, and I had I played the guitar, so um, it was easy for me to just translate the chords as long as I knew, as long as I could look at a, a, a sheet music and say, "Oh, that's how you play this chord on a ukulele." Um, and just like in on a guitar or a piano, as long as you know C G D. Um, mm. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. You can you can fake your way through any song, but um, Ricky started playing the ukulele. So then I got a ukulele at the same shop he had gotten his, and it was really nice. And so he and I used to like while we were sitting at our tables, you know, we had downtime. We would always make up songs, and so when we started doing these panels, um, that's how we would bring the ukuleles out, and that would because you know the panels are great. I love the panels, but a lot of the times you're kind of asked the same questions over and over again. And um, we eventually we started answering uh, the, the before we'd ever saw like, hey, everyone, thanks for coming to the panel. I don't have a favorite character. They're all part of me. Uh, my favorite episode <laughs> is uh, is uh, Pastulio, Rise of the Zip Boy. And I would answer everything before it was ever asked. That's good. And I like then, that. I like yeah. that. And then yeah. that would lead to better, like, like more, like never asked, never before asked questions. But the ukulele often broke that up. Or as I called it, the ukulele. <laughs> That's why they say it in Hawaii, the ukulele. I'm actually going to Hawaii, me and my um, girlfriend, for a, a holiday in a few what months. What island? Uh, the, the main island. Oahu? Ohio, Oahu. That's how Oahu. you say it. Yeah. Yeah. I, don't want, I don't want to butcher it. But um, do you have any recommendations for other islands or things to do or so i'm a huge fan of oahu because um it's it's very city-like so there's everything there that you know everything you would you would love there's like a whole hotel row that's gorgeous you can't beat beat mm. the beach um but if you're going to travel to other um um islands if you're looking for something romantic and more of like a like a romantic getaway yeah. then Kauai. oh okay. <clears throat> maui is also great um, but there's a, it's that's mostly a family uh, spot. So if you want families, then Maui is really nice. But Kauai, Maui, um, 
the big island's nice, but it's, you know, it's very volcanic. So the beaches are volcanic. So um, the rocks oh. are kind of hard. It's not really like the white sands of, of, of Waikiki uh, or Maui. Mm. So my, my two favorite, islands, or my three favorite, islands, although I guess my two favorite islands <laughs> are uh, Oahu yeah. and Maui. Awesome. Yeah. Going back to Turgle, how did you land this opportunity? I'm guessing now they reach out to you, right? You don't have to do as many auditions these days, I'm hoping. Um, on a lot <laughs> of things, yes. But on this, no. Because, I mean, think about it. This is Star Wars. So, <laughs> I mean, it, that's the thing that I always like. And the thing that I hate about that tweet that I wrote is yeah. that I was doing it on my phone while I was at an appointment because <laughs> I was just blown away by people telling me about this one. And I wrote Canon, C A N N O N, <laughs> and I did it. And um, I looked oh, at no. it. Wait, wait a second. And yeah, then yeah. my son said to me, "You know, you said Canon with two N's. It's Canon with one N." I'm like, "Oh my gosh, you're right." So I had to reply to my tweet and say C A N O N. Sorry, you know. <laughs> um, but that's the thing. You can't edit on Twitter. You can't edit. That's the thing. So I would have uh... fixed it. But um. Um, Turgle, uh, that was an audition like anything else. And then the callback for Tom was, uh, via, uh, zoom, just like this. Only I was standing, uh, with the, like behind my, um, my, my green screen and he would direct me and I would move as Turgle and I would do the scene as Turgle. And he was, can we see a little movement? Which I did. I did the jump and the walk. And, uh, I was fortunate because I had worked with Tom for years, I had done a lot of games with Tom. But I just never done the mocap games with him. So that's how that came to be. What did he? Deborah Wilson, who plays Seer oh, in the Deborah. game, she yeah. she I, I was interviewing her and she said he's he's just so good at what he does. Tom is amazing. Yeah, Tom is amazing. It's a it's a it's not it's very much about the acting, and that's what a lot of people don't realize. If people hear voiceover, they think. Um, it's just if you have a great voice or you can make sounds or voice like that, but it's not. And that's, we spend, before we ever even get into our, our outfits or thing, we do like a whole cast circle. We warm up, we do exercises, we do, you know, we do movement exercises because, you know, it gets intense uh, in the, in the vault. It's called the vault, the studio that we shoot in. Um, like if you think about the Kobo Cantina, right. You think about the bar. Mm. That was just a bunch of boxes, you know, on top of each other. And that's what we play to. So wow. I, I, I'm i like, I'm a big firm believer. I'm not a method actor or anything like that, but I am an imagination. I, I, I teach voiceover. And one of the things I teach is something called the art of playing pretend. And it's all, it's designed to remind us what it was like to play as we did when we were children, because our imaginations were just running rampant as a child. So that's what this is about. It's playing make believe. So, in that that scene, I'm guessing you were with uh, Cameron and DC and those guys. That was the yeah. big yeah. scene for you. In yeah, the DC. I've known DC for a long time. He's a, you know he's a very funny guy. Yeah. DC Douglas is great, uh, and Cameron was great. And we were with um, we were with uh, who 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 is that? How do they do that? Um, it's an actual robot. It actually is moves, but there's a guy going on a, wow. this like vocal thing that makes the sounds and everything. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's cool. I didn't yeah. know that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So he's go. always placed in our, in, in the vault where he's supposed to be. And, and it's, it's, it's just a magical process. And we were doing all of this in the middle of COVID. So we would have to come in and and we'd all have to test before we were ever allowed in. And you had to pass the, you know, the PCR test. And most days you had to go like a day before your shooting day. And then there were some people that didn't, you know, pass. So we would have to re do our reschedule things. And that's probably why, but I'm surprised we got it out as fast as we did. Yeah, it's amazing. Oh, wow. And when did you, how did you come up with the voice on this one? It, did you draw on another character in particular? Did you try and come up with something new? Did you, how did you workshop it? Would you say? So I'm kind of a, I'm kind of a different voiceover actor than a lot of voiceover actors. I, I don't have a huge range. 
because no matter what I do, you always know it's my voice because it's um, it's um, a very distinct voice. It, there's just no doubt about it. I can do whatever you want, and you're probably going to know it's me. Even when I'm Alpha 5, it's like, ay, 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 Zordon, the Power Rangers are in trouble. You still hear me in there, right? So I have a saying that says the voice does the work of the spirit of play. Because if you think about it, we do voices all the time without thinking what voice are we going to use. In other words, if you see a little baby, you don't go up, you don't see a baby and go, now what voice should I use that lets this baby know that I think it's cute? <laughs> no, that scared it. We automatically hey. go, what a cutie. You're a cutie. And if you have a pet, it's the same thing. Go get your ball. Go get your ball. We do voices all the time without thinking it. So I've always been a firm believer that the voice will come out as I'm playing. And that's the voice that comes out. And so very similar to a lot of my other voices, but different characters because I have different wants in different stories. And so the story is different. And so that's what I go with because I, I thought years ago, I go to see Robert De Niro in, in, uh, in every movie he's in for the most part. But you could argue that Robert De Niro is the same in Goodfellas as he is in, you know, um, Casino as he is in The Irishman. And yet we follow him into those stories. And that's how I've always approached my voiceover career is story comes first. Nothing's more important to me than the story. Um, and so when that story is real for me and all my words are informed and I'm dressed in the suit and all that stuff, the voice comes out as I'm ready to play. And that's what came out. No, 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 wait, 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 wait. You know? So it was frog-like. <laughs> and I, I actually, I when I do these, I, I try not to even say voice acting. I, I try Ooh. to just say acting. Because it's, you know, as you said, it's not voice acting. It is, it is acting. You have to be a good actor. First and well, foremost. Yeah. And I, there's, not, there's, not a, uh, there's not a voiceover actor in the world that wouldn't, say that you know it's just it's the acting first because you may be able to do a million different voices but that's all they are are voices but we don't create voices we create characters and so if i were to set someone up on a date no one would ever say well what's their voice like right they would say well what's turgle's voice like you know if if you were setting turgle up on a date you would say, oh, Turgle can be annoying. He's, you know, he's, you know, he's got some vulnerability. He can also, he's a bit of a scam artist. It's all about their personality. Yeah. And so the personality is what comes through. Um, and the voice, you know, just follows. How do you balance on a character like that, the the schemingness and the, not, not annoyingness, but that side versus the lovability and making him an endearing character as well? Um. You know, I learned a lesson many, many years ago um, from the executive producer of The Angry Beavers. And um, <clears throat> she came in, her name was Mary Harrington, and she said to the creator of the show, Mitch Shower, you know, it's great that you've got these beavers um, like hurtling towards the sun or going kersplunking with a, with a stump or what, or, you know, whatever. But what is it that brings us back to the story every week, every week. And without, without even a hesitation, Mitch said, they're brothers. This is a story about brothers. And that really stuck with me. Uh, and to this day, when I'm at conventions, people who grew up watching Ingrid Beavers, the first thing that says, oh my gosh, I was Daggett and my brother was Norbert and my dad loves that show because we were like fighting like you and, and it was always about the brother. Relatable, which, yeah. Relatable. And so that's what's important to me about any character that would be perceived as obnoxious or annoying. There has to be something redeeming and lovable about them. Otherwise, it's just like, oh, shut up, you know? And I know that for a lot of people, that is Turgle. They, you know, they let the let the Bedlam Raiders kill him, you know? Oh, um, I don't know about that. But I think but, I, but, I saw an article that yeah. said. I will protect Turgle with my yes, life. Yes, I will protect that? him with my life. Yeah, <laughs> that was funny. Uh, um, I just think that that there's heart in everybody, even people that yeah. seem heartless. I think you know if you scratch, the, if you dig down deep enough, you'll find something. And for me, someone's not just a con artist; they're a survivor. 
And why are they surviving? What have they been through? What, and I ask questions. So the way I approach a story is I ask questions about my story because it'd be easy to just play the outline, which is like what I call acting the breakdown. Yeah, you know, oh, he's a turtle that's annoying. Hey, what are you doing? And then they can just, you know, but that's not enough for me. Like, why did I, why did I sell that to the Raider? Why did I, where's the real one? Did I know that it was broken and all, I mean, did I know that it was fake? All those sort of things. And and sometimes you have to come up with that yourself, don't you? You don't get yeah. that um, delivered I, to you. I like to, um, I like to play the game. I like to take the information given to me and try to connect the dots. Mm. And so I have a reason for why I say and do everything I say and do in a story. And it's not just because that's what's written. Mm. It's never because that's what's written. Because we can act anything. But I don't like the feeling of directing from inside my head, like, oh, I should have done that line better. Um, we have a reason for why we do things. And for me, it's the want. So I always find, what do I want in this scene? I, I, like in the first scene, I don't want to die. <laughs> that's, that's the first thing. That's the crux um, of it, yeah. Yeah, it's the crux of it. Um, uh, but if you think about it, I I feel like I always want to be talking as if it has happened to me or is currently happening to me. Otherwise, I'm stuck in my actor brain trying to be funny. Um, and I don't ever think that's a healthy way to play. Um, because then you're relying on an audience for your validation easy to do a line in a funny way on stage because you get instant gratification but if you're playing in a make-believe world if i'm turgle i'm not trying to be funny and i think that has a lot to do with the heart that we were talking about not trying to be funny is is the best thing is just deal with the situation don't die turgle don't die you know so and I, I, I feel like there's a bit of your voice directing part of you seeping in there. Do you feel like that's changed your outlook when you get in the booth or when you're in the volume, the vault or whatever, like being a director now of, of voices and a, and teaching it, does it change the volume, your outlook? Yeah, the volume. I like that you said that, the volume. I think you're right. Um, <laughs> um, is there is there something about my directing that comes from, from my teaching? I mean, that yeah, that and also the fact that does now that you're on both sides of the of the wall or the fence, you know, does that change anything about your performance now, knowing that you've been on, you know, you've been directing people as well? Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I yes, uh, but it, it's kind of reverse for me because okay. I learned from my mentor, my my acting teacher, which. To call her an acting teacher is is almost uh, an insult because she was more <laughs> than an acting teacher. She like was life changing for me. She's a woman by the name of Diana Castle, and Diana Castle, um, when I first started working, I was what was referred to as product oriented, meaning I don't know, like I knew that was the funny line, so I would sell it. But then what happens is you depend on an audience for your validation or what you book for your validation and all sorts of things. That's, that's, it's, it's a primary reality concern, not a secondary reality. And she said to me, you, you're, you're validating your performance by the reception you get either by being booked for a job or getting a laugh from an audience. But in a secondary reality, there is no audience you're trying to make laugh. And that stuck with me for a long time. And uh, I studied with her for five years. She's, still one of the most amazing people I know. Um, and so when I went to direct, it was just an extension of how I teach. And when I'm working with actors, because oftentimes we used to be all be in the same room at the same time, but since the days of COVID, we're all on Zoom and sometimes we're in our own places, but most of the time it's just me and the other actor doing their line. So I act out every part as I'm working with them. And I think that the actors- Do they love that? Does that, they does that resonate with them? Oh, yeah. Very much so. Mm. Because that, it lets their imagination work instead of just doing three different inflections, one take, two take, two, three take. Um, but yeah, for directing, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a natural extension for me. It's just, it's just teaching still. It's just yeah. teaching. And not that I'm teaching the actors, but the way I approach it, I think they appreciate it because I'm story-based. I, I mean, you never have to give an actor 
a line reading. What you need to do is you need to set their the, the playground for them. The playground is this what I call the story in which you would use these words so that you don't feel like you have to sell the line. I always use this example yeah. of, uh, did you ever see the the movie uh, Meet the Fockers or, or Meet yeah, the Parents? With, Meet with, the Parents, um, Robert De Niro. Robert De Niro, yeah. And Ben Stiller, right? We watched it the other day, yeah. Great okay, movie. so you'll yeah. remember this. Yeah. There was a scene where Greg goes to meet Robert De Niro and I believe his wife was Blythe Danner. I think it was Blythe Danner, I'm not sure, was the mom. But Greg is there and for some reason, I can't remember the setup, but there's some reason they they're, they Greg doesn't say that he's Jewish. And yeah. so they sit down to dinner and, and Robert yeah. says, would you like to do the, the, the prayer, Greg? And he's like, oh, oh, yeah, right? And so Greg starts to go, uh, Lord, dear Lord, three things we pray. And he starts to recite the lyrics uh, the day by day. <laughs> and when it's over, uh, De Niro yeah. says, well, that was uh, some prayer, Greg. I didn't realize you were so uh, religious. And, and and Ben Stiller says, well, yeah, you know, very pious family growing up on a farm. He says, you grew up on a farm, did you, Greg? And he says, yeah, you know, up with up with the sun, you know, milking the cows, the goats, and the cats. And De Niro says, you milk the cat, Greg? And he says, yeah, well, you can pretty much milk anything with nipples. And De Niro says, well, how about me, Greg? I've got nipples. Can you milk me? Right? Now, in the hands of an actor that yeah. wants to make himself or herself or themselves more important than the the story, they'll try to sell that joke. Yeah. They'll be like, well, I'll be Greg. Yeah. Robert De Niro didn't have to try to sell the joke. He just have to, had to go after his want, and his want was to catch Greg in a lie. So catching what Greg a in example. a lie yeah. was more important to him than making a line. Being funny. Than, yeah. than being funny. Yeah. And then being funny. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm sure you have examples like that all the time with your work, even Ooh. probably with Turgle. Yeah. Definitely with Turgle because I've been very fortunate with the people I've worked with, including um, the, the Jedi survivor team um, that they trust me to be able to improvise. And so I'm a true improviser, meaning I'm not a rewriter. That's, that's the difference between people who come up with cleverly rehearsed improvised lines and things that happen as we're playing because I immerse myself in the imagined, the secondary reality so much, those improv lines come out naturally of the situation. So, um, so yeah, so there's lots of examples like that. In Invader Zim, I'll give you a perfect one. Um, we were, uh, it was Enter the Florpus. We were, we were recording the movie Enter the Florpus for Netflix, uh, sem, I don't know, seven years ago now, um, maybe less. But anyway, um, there's a scene at the end where, Dib is running over the planets and Zim is running after him and Dib is shouting something and Zim Zim says you're ugly when you lie Dib and and Dib says I'm not lying and that's where the scene ended but as we were playing I said then how come you're ugly you know so that came out of that moment because that's how we are in in if that and were that, really us. so that's so awesome uh I wanted to know as well the did you because you said you know you've done a lot of improv over the years and you've splashed that into your work and you've been able to do that. Did they let you do that for a franchise like Star Wars? I feel like there's less. Absolutely, they do. Uh, absolutely, yeah. Wow. I mean, because um, well, well, there's like this, you know, oh, Star Wars. Da -da 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 <laughs> yeah. Right? We're still just playing pretend. I'm in my yeah. booth right here in my studio and, and we're on Zoom and we're playing and I'll throw something out there and oftentimes yeah. go, oh yeah, let's do, let's do a couple of those. You never know. And so, and a lot of those things end up in there. A lot of that with Raz in, in, in Psychonauts too, because that's the creative process. And that's what I've been fortunate to experience in my life that I've never worked with any just like, you know, do it this way, say it this way, get out. I've never done that. I've, I've always been lucky that the people I work for recognize that it's the art that we're all creating so that it's not about our egos. 
So there's never, I've never had an ego clash in my life in, in this world, in the voiceover community. Wow. Although there is ego in the voiceover community, I've seen it. But for me, we're always talking about the story and making the story better or making the story funnier or making the story more believable. It's always, well, what about this? And we talk about it and we talk story. Tim Schaefer would always paint the picture so clearly. And, and God bless Chris Brown, who is our voice director, who is amazing. She's amazing, Chris Brown, where she was always very, um, very on top of things like we don't want to take mental illness lightly. Mm. And that's what Psychonauts 2 is very much about. And, and it resonates for people that play. Oh, my God, I get that. I get the feeling. I get the feeling that Raz is going through or what that that brain that I've jumped into. I know what that's like to have anxiety or depression or whatever it is. Um, and we were very conscious about that. And 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 then when we went to record. We I would, you know, do the, the lines as written. And sometimes I would just do something that came to me in that moment. And a lot of times the things that come to me in that moment are the things that end up in the in the in the game or the TV show or what or the movie or what have you. You mentioned anxiety. I, I did have a question from from a fan who said um it was actually from Anonymous. I don't know who said it, but they said, Do you have anything that helps with anxiety, Richard? Oh yeah, I do. And yeah. and and it's I, I've suffered from anxiety for years. Um, and I didn't even know it was anxiety. <laughs> you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. I didn't even know it was. That's what it was. Um, but I was taught this and it changed my life. Uh, the first thing is, is I was taught the definition of anxiety. So the definition of anxiety to me is the belief that we will be unable to handle whatever it is we imagine happening. The belief we will be unable to handle whatever it is we imagine happening. And so, in which case, two things. One, we it, oftentimes, when we imagine the worst case scenarios, more times than not, they don't come to pass. And so you've worried needlessly. But if they do come to pass, you've now worried twice as long as you actually need to. And so when the worst comes to pass, I have a mantra that was taught to me that I use, which is, I'll see what happens. I'll handle it. I'm okay. And I was taught, I was taught it as a walking mantra. So I can actually pace because if you're anxious like me, I pace. I pace. I'm like a, I'm like a, like a panther in a cage when I'm really anxious. So as with each step, I go, I'll see what happens. I'll handle it. I'm okay. I'll see what happens. I'll handle it. I'm okay. I'll see what happens. I'll handle it. I'm okay. So this is a story I've told before, but I can give you an example of how I've used this in my career. Um, when we were coming back to do Invader Zim after you know, 20 years. By that point, we hadn't recorded an, an Invader Zim episode in 20 years, 16 and a half years, probably. Um, I had traveled the world knowing what the fans had come to expect. And I was 20 years older than when we did it. Mm. And since then, I had done a lot of characters that made my voice drop a little bit lower, believe it or not, and maybe a little bit raspier. So I was very concerned that my voice wasn't going to sound the same as it did. So when, before we ever recorded the, the, the movie, uh, Ricky Simons and I went into Nickelodeon and we did the promo for it. And all the promo was, was, <laughs> and you're going, Aah! we just laugh, laugh, laugh. And then it just says Invader Zim coming soonish. So when we went to record that, I said, Jonan, Jonan Vasquez is the creator. I said, Jonan, does it sound like Zim? Yes, it sounds like Zim. Relax. You're going to pitch it, right? Now, we're fine. It sounds great. Right? So I was very anxious about it. And so I let it go. But then, as, you know, everything on the internet is true. I don't know if you knew that or not. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> but when the promo came out, when the promo came out, the first thing that, the first comment in there was, is it me 
or does it sound like Horvitz smokes six packs of cigar <laughs> six packs of cigarettes a day now? Yeah, yeah. But true to the internet, there's always a fan there to defend you. And the next comment was, "Give the guy a break. He's like eighty now." <laughs> <laughs> Little so, did they know you're only 20. Yeah. Right. So <laughs> so we go to record the movie and I'm now uh, anxious and, and it's, it's, you know, everyone was there. We'd all gathered. We hadn't worked together. We'd seen each other a lot over the years because we're friends, but we hadn't been in the booth doing, you know, this story for a long time. And you've got those comments in the back of your head a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I got the comments in the back of my head. I'm like, after each take, um, I'm saying, does that sound right? Is that something? Jonan's like, yes, it sounds fine. And I'm like this having the, an, a panic anxiety attack about it not sounding like what I thought it should sound like because I'm thinking 20 years earlier. So I said, I need a minute and I need to go out. And uh, I do my mantra. I'll see what happens. I'll handle it. I'm okay. And I go back in and I had a great session. We had great several sessions. It was like we'd picked up exactly where we left off. It wasn't like 20 years had passed. So when I told the person who had taught me this mantra what had happened, his response was, yeah, but <clears throat> you didn't really get to the heart of the anxiety. I'm like, what do you mean? And he, he said, well, your fear, <clears throat> excuse me, your fear was that you couldn't do it anymore and that they would replace you and that you would not be Zim anymore. That's it. Yeah. In which case, I'll see what happens. I'll handle it. I'm okay. And when I thought about that, I hadn't done Zim in 20 years and it hadn't stopped me from doing a ton of other jobs since then. So um, that was how I used the anxiety mantra. Thank you, Anonymous. I love when people ask me. Yeah. About uh, thank you for that response. I'll give you a couple more because I know you're very busy. Uh, Trevor <laughs> asked, well, this isn't a question, but he said, Richard, you are my childhood. Ah, uh, yes, that's a common <laughs> one. I always say when people say that you're my childhood, I always respond, well, your parents owe me babysitting money. <laughs> uh, Pink <laughs> says, Thank you, Trevor. Pink says, you did a great job as Turgle, Richard. You are one of my favorite actors of all time. Uh, thank you, Pete. I appreciate it. Quantum Pete, what's your favorite game you've worked on? I We already know. For sweet. Yeah. Can't answer that. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> if I want to work for them again, I'm not going to yeah, say no, that. Right. They're all favorites. Yes. Uh, Jez, biggest lesson you've learned from being a successful actor for over 30 years. Well, I think it's more than 30 years, but. But no, yeah. 30 for voice acting for sure. Okay. Uh, there you go. Lesson. You know what? I'm going to steal what I learned because I realized that Tom Hanks said this in, a, in an interview a while back when it was like, like six very famous actors were sitting down and um, what Tom Hanks said is, uh, this too shall pass, meaning the good stuff will pass and the bad stuff will pass. And so the biggest lesson I learned is to one, never take anything for granted because no. everything can change. And the second thing I learned is that um, never stop doing the work because it's very easy to rest on past laurels but you always want to be focusing on the work and the playtime it's kind of that if you build it they will come mentality like i just focused on turgle i had no idea that turgle would become a meme you know the minute it was released because i was just doing my job um and i guess the other thing i i learned is that when you're young you're always trying to get to the top you're always trying to get to the top. Mm. But then the more you work, you realize there really isn't a top. <laughs> and it's, it's ever not, changing, isn't it? It's, it's ever it's, changing. And it's yeah. never about getting to the top. It's about do the work. I was at a convention recently with um, with Vivian Madrano, the creator of Hell of a Boss. And someone had gotten up in the panel and asked, um, is there even room for us, us other uh, indie animators at the top. Is there even room for us? Like almost like resentful of us because we had, we were at supposedly this this top. And I just responded, the, you can't focus on getting to the top. You just do what you do. And that's yeah. it. And that's yeah. it. You do what you do. 
you know, I, I saw uh, Bob Dylan, the No Way Home, or yeah, I think it was called No Way Home, was a documentary on PBS years ago. And everyone's talking about, oh, and he was the voice of the generation. He spoke to us and he was blah, 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 blah. And they just cut to this close up of Dylan just staring blankly at the camera. And he says, finally, I didn't start out to be no voice of a generation. I just wrote songs that I liked. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Yeah. 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 No, 100%. That was a good question. Thank you for that question. What, yeah, what great is question. These questions. Any more? I love questions. Yeah, we've got a few more. Uh, Brad asks, can we please hear the Turgle voice? I, it is my favorite voice you've ever done. Really, Ravis? I didn't know. <laughs> this another... is him, Doma. This is him. <laughs> this is from Anonymous again, someone else. Uh, are there still any voices you haven't been able to use that are in your back pocket? <laughs> no, because as I've said, I don't really create voices. I just exactly. think the voice is the work of the spirit of play. So whatever comes out. Um, every time I think I'm doing Elvis, it turns out I'm doing a share. <laughs> Gypsies, <laughs> trim sale, please. I think I'm doing Elvis. But everyone goes, that's share? That's a great share. I'm like, yeah, I'm doing share. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, Someone asked about Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy. Talk, just talk to us about that briefly, because that's a show that I was a bit older at the time when it was playing here in Australia, but my brother loved it. And I'd always hear and, and watch it just coming across it. And such yeah. a good show. Talk to us about that one. So that was an interesting one because that show was part of the You Pick Weekend for Cartoon Network many, many years ago, many years ago. And what they would do is they would they would air three pilots, like three seven minute pilots, or maybe it was a five minute pilot. I don't remember seven. And then the audience would vote on the one they wanted to be a series. Damn. So I believe when we, I think the I think the three were Billy and Mandy. Yeah. Robot Jones and Long Hair and Double Dome. I think those were the three. So Billy and Mandy. Um, was selected so it's like oh good i got a series i got another series but in the meantime i didn't hear anything here a year had gone by nothing like oh okay well in the meantime it's starting doing um invader zim and so yeah. all of a sudden grim adventures back then was called grim and evil because they had grim adventures of billy and mandy and evil concarney and to be honest with you i was a little aggravated with evil concarney because it was two shows in one and I was only in half the show, so I didn't get paid for the other half. Oh, really? Because That's I'm weird. Because I'm not in Evil Concarney. I'm only in Billy and Mandy. Right. Eventually, they they got rid of the Evil Concarney, and it just became Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy. But the thing was, was that at the time I would record Invader Zim in the morning at at Nickelodeon, and then go to Cartoon Network in the afternoon to record Billy and Mandy, and it was just so horrible on my voice, you know, on my vocal cords. So. We ended up doing like like Billy and Mandy on, I think it was Tuesdays, maybe Mondays, maybe Tuesdays. And then I wouldn't do Zim until Thursday so my voice could recover. Uh, so I was doing those shows at the same time. Uh, I actually got to write two episodes. Uh, one was called um, The um, Bad News Ghouls. And then my wife, Kristen, and I wrote um, the Keeper of the Reaper episode um, along with Carl Greenblatt where they introduced... Fred Fredberger, Fred Fredberger. That was Carl's, uh, Carl's uh, uh, creation. Um, wow. And uh, that was smart because it was seen through the eyes of Fred Fredberger. He, he had a protagonist that was witnessing all this, which I thought was brilliant. Um, and so that was a great show. It was one where I got to improvise a lot. I got to work with amazing people like Gray Delisle and um, and Greg Eagles and uh, so many Dietrich Bader and Billy West and Bob Paulson and uh, Tom Kenny and and oh, Lewis wow. yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, it was just everyone was on the show. Yeah. yeah, everyone was on that show. Yeah, and what about coming back for Power Rangers recently? What was that like? Oh, that's, that's a good question. Is that surreal uh, coming back all those years later and? Yeah, yeah, it was very surreal um, because for a big part of my career, I didn't even really talk about Alpha 5 for the longest time. Why was that? Uh, was there a reason? 
Yeah, I wasn't really happy with Saban. You know, I thought okay. Saban didn't treat their actors as well as they could have. Okay. Um, and then they sold it to uh, Fox Kids, and then they bought it back again, and then I think Disney had it for a brief time or something. But now it's owned by Hasbro, and Hasbro was a good company and treated us well. And I like the story and I like the script, so I was happy to come back as as Alpha Nine. Um, and I was glad that Barbara Goodson came back as Rita Repulse. I thought it was clever. And if you watch it, I was pretty impressed that it felt like an episode, which is mm-hmm. what I also liked about the Invader Zim uh, reunion show is that it, it it was just a giant episode again. And mm-hmm. I thought the magic was still there in that episode. I thought everyone still looked great and sounded great. And uh, so I really had a good time. I sat and watched it. And what I really liked is that uh, it was meant to be a tribute uh, to Twee, uh, Trini, the Yellow Ranger, who had uh, tragically passed away uh, not long after uh, Power Rangers. It was actually, you know, just a couple of years. She was young. She was in her 20s. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, we had it had already been shot and was in the can before um, uh, Jason uh, Frank's mm-hmm. passing. And uh, and so I, I think we, we could, we wish we could have done more, but it was already done, you know. And already done. Yeah. 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 Wow. So how do you look back on your career, mate, and just gratitude, would you say? Gratitude above all else because yeah. I, I've been fortunate that I've been able to do what I get to do and proudly say, yeah, my job is to play pretend. Like, what do you do? I play pretend. I play pretend fully, and, and it, it's okay. It's okay to just play for a living. Um. And uh, I look back and I think to myself, wow, uh, you know, I can't believe how many years has gone by. I just kept on keeping on and just doing the next job and doing the next job. And, you know, you hope that maybe I I just said I just said uh, to my wife yesterday, do you think that when I have shed this mortal coil and left this earth, do you think that my show's will still go on. Do you think anyone will remember Invader Zim? Do you think anyone will remember these things? Do you think they'll still be aired like we see old Bugs Bunnies and all those things from years ago? Um, and neither of us had an answer. I, I don't have an answer because I think that when we're gone, we're gone. Who knows? It doesn't really matter at that point. But I'd like to think that somehow I made a mark while I was here and and, and hopefully gave back as much as I could. I think that's what I'd like to think, that I gave back as much as I could. You've definitely made a mark. And, I mean, you're only young, mate. You've still got many, many years to go. Ah. Your best projects are ahead of you. Your <laughs> I best, hope so. Your best From projects your are ahead of God, you. You heard him, God. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything you wanted to say to the fans that have tuned in today, mate? And Yeah, um, I just want to say thank you so much for uh, for all your support over the years. Thank you for being here today and and listening to me uh, pontificate for an hour and a half. <laughs> um, and uh, thank you. I just think thank you. Thank you, Rich. And do you have anything um, that you've got coming out that you can talk about? I know it's very secretive that stuff. I can but talk about. Is there anything uh, that? Yeah. I continue to work on the Loud House, which is oh nice, uh, yeah. And I do, I do a couple of characters on that, so I continue to work on that. Um, yes, I do have. Uh, well, this, a hell of a boss. We're still in the middle of releasing season uh, two, and so keep your eyes out for that, and uh, keep your eyes out for Has Been Hotel, which will be released uh, not too not not too long. And um, thank you. Keep him busy. Beautiful. Yeah. Uh, Richard, it's been an absolute pleasure, mate. Thank you for taking the time with me today. This is a real honor, a real pleasure to talk to you, mate. Pleasure's all mine, Dan. I appreciate it. And before I let you go, can we, can, can Turgle say anything to Dan? Is that possible? Thank you. I I don't know why I'm here, Dan. Uh, I know. I'll speak your language. Good day, mate. Good day, mate. I need some water. Water. No, no. Oh, thank you, Richard. I appreciate that, mate. You're welcome. Oh, I look forward to doing this again, mate. Thank you Me so too, much. Dan, and have a great have a great night, mate. I really appreciate it. <laughs>